So it was a little over 20 years ago when I found myself not feeling well. And since mostly I have very good health, it was unusual. And my wife encouraged me to go into the doctor. And so I go in there and, you know, you're ready for the exam and whatever you're going to tell him about how you're feeling. And I basically just had a, a kind of a dull pain right in the center of my stomach. And he said to me, what can I do for you? And I said very glibly, I want you to tell me this isn't appendicitis. And so he did a bunch of tests on me and prodded and poked and took my blood. And, and he said, no, nah, I think you're right. It's not appendicitis. So I went, went camping with a friend and we rode horses and swam in the lake and just all kinds of fun time. But I was slowly not feeling good a little more and a little more. Then come to find out the doctor was wrong. You shouldn't tell him your diagnosis ahead of time. I did have appendicitis. And it wasn't the build up and make pressure and then you really hurt, so something has to be done. Or was it the explode and maybe kill you kind of thing? It was a slow leak, a little perforation. And over the next several days, actually, that things that were supposed to be in my stomach and intestines now was suddenly all through my body cavity. So by the time they made a diagnosis and I had a surgeon and we actually got there, I was a pretty sick puppy. So they had to take all my insides out and wash them and put them all back in. And, and it was a really, it was a scary deal. And we are talking about the unstoppable church. And one of the beautiful pictures in the scripture of the church is a body, the body of Christ. And so last week we, we talked about the unstoppable church and maybe there's a little dissonance in you. You think, I know lots of churches that are stopped. And the sad truth is that 80% of the churches in America are plateaued or declining. That kind of sounds a lot like stopped. And what we're trying to focus on is the fact that God's kingdom, God's church will never be stopped, but our local church, family church can be stopped. So how do we become the unstoppable local church? And that is by following what God has told us. And last week, Pastor Ed gave I think a very inspirational overview of the whole of what this series is going to be. And it's a very simple four statements that he made, which were, we have the people of God filled with the spirit of God, fueled by the power of God to accomplish the mission of God. Now, if you're taking notes on your paper outline, or if you're on the app, I want you just to fill those blanks in. And I want you to think about that. The people of God, that's us. We belong to God. And we're going to focus in on that this week, filled with the spirit of God. Obviously, the unstoppable group part is not the people. The spirit of God filling us is what makes it unstoppable and fueled by the power of God. We're going to talk about how do you tap into the power of God and see that in your life to accomplish the mission of God. So I want you to just say that with me out loud. I want you to get this, the rhythm of our series, the, the emphasis that's going to come on each week. So let's say this together. The people of God filled with the spirit of God, fueled by the power of God to accomplish the mission of God. So as I said, this week, we're going to focus in on what does it mean to be the people of God? And there's two very biblical pictures that I think give not only clarity, but some of the emphasis of what it means to be the people of God. And the first one is the body of Christ. So many, many places in scripture, it gives this image that Jesus is the head. He is the, the top. He's the brains. He's the one that directs the body, but that we are the body of Christ, the hands and feet. We are, we are his representatives. We are the physical expression of the kingdom of God, of, of God's work in our world. And it, it is a wonderful picture, number one, because everybody can relate. We all have a body. And probably most of us take it too much for granted. This body that you have received is the coolest car you will ever drive. I mean, if you think about what people can do in terms of balance and strength, in terms of flexibility and skill and focus, and, you know, if you start watching just what people can do with their body when they have trained their body to do what the head directs it to do. It's incredible. And that same picture comes out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he talks about that God has given all of us spiritual gifts, that each of us have unique abilities. And he uses again, this picture of a body. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. If you have your Bible with you, or if you can turn in your app, it says 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14 says, 
just as a body, though one has many parts and all of its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So he talks about even some of the things that were probably clearly divisive in the early church, whether you were a a person of a Jewish background or a Gentile who was not raised with any of the the teachings of of the Torah and the Old Testament. And he says, all of those are combined into one, but it's not one cookie cutter style of Christian. It is a whole bunch of different pieces that are then connected to the head and therefore connected to each other. So a couple of key insights about this picture is I am connected to every other part. So he goes on and says in chapter 12, let me read a couple more verses down in verse 25. He says, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. He says, we are deeply connected to each other. And this is a little illustration of all of the different systems of the body and all of the ways in which they have to work together. And all of them have to be functional if you are to be healthy. Now, there are parts of your body that you can live without. If you lose a limb, you lose your leg or you lose an arm, you can accommodate and figure out how to, how to work things. You can live without one kidney. You can live without certain parts of your body, but it is hindering the work of the body. And so he says, I want you first of all to see that you're all part of the same thing. And all of those differences that tend to cause us to, 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 to team up and say, we're on this team. I'm on, I'm on the ear team and you're on the foot team. He says, that's not how it should be. And he actually does kind of a a sarcastic comment here in the chapter. He says, is the ear going to say to the foot, because you're not an ear, you can't be part of the body? And I think they were having two particular difficulties. They were having, number one, some people who just kind of look down on their own gift. It's like, it's not very much. It's not that exciting. It's not that interesting. And, And they felt inferior. And maybe there were some people that had stellar gifts or public gifts, or they were excellent at speaking or at, or at leading in some way. And, and the person who's looking at their, their, their gifting and going, man, I got nothing. This is kind of just kind of all I was given. And, and maybe they have a little gift envy. And then they had, so to those people, he's saying, no, no, you have a very, very special gift. And then those were, there were others who were looking down and like, I've got the giftedness and you are just nothing. You know, I'm a speaker in front of thousands. What do you do? You hand out bread and clean toilets. And what, what is it that you do? And so he was saying that we have to have an equal concern for each other. And we have to understand that the body needs all the parts that other people don't have to be like me to be a vital part of the body. And in fact, I think it's kind of interesting you talk about we're all connected, but the the next part says, I have a part to to play, that the body depends on me, whether I think that I have a stellar, showy, important, notable gift or not, the body depends on me. And so I hope that one of the things that comes out of that is is a feeling of, of connectedness. I mean, the the church of God is, is a movement that is the greatest cause that, we, that you can ever be involved in to, to bring the salvation of Jesus to the, to the lost people of the world. It's an eternal cause. It's, it's better than saving the planet. It's better than saving the animals. It's better than whatever you want to save. And, and so there's this wonderful sense that we are connected together and in this great, great cause. And then the other side of that is I have a very important part to play. Because see, I think this is part of what makes the church unstoppable is if every part does its job. Uh, Ephesians 2.10, which Pastor Will, or Pastor Ed quoted last week, was that God has prepared good works for us to do in advance. He, he's custom designed them. And, and you think about the parts of the body, and, and this is a picture of a l- little appendix. 
And it was interesting how people's mindsets changes how they even see the body. There, there was a period of time when I was younger, when the teaching in the schools was that because of evolution, we have vestigial organs. And what that means is we used to need them, but now we've developed in our evolution and they're just, they're just there, but they're not useful or functional. In fact, the doctors would routinely, if they were going into some kind of internal surgery, they would just take out the appendix because it's useless. Well, you know what they found out? <laughs> it's a very small, seemingly unimportant part of the body, but it has a vital role. In fact, they found at least four key things that the appendix does. And one of them, it has to do with fetal development. As the child develops in the womb, there is a specific part that the appendix plays. And, and then there's also a role that it plays in our immune system, helping fight off diseases, especially in the intestines. And then it also, if you have a bad uh, illness, or perhaps that you take antibiotics and you lose all of your good bacteria, the, the appendix helps repopulate your intestine systems with good bacteria. And, and interestingly enough, the very surgeons who used to just take it all out, they now leave it because sometimes it can become a great substitute for another, another part of the body that they can replace and they put the appendix in someplace else and it's a, it serves a second function. So here's something they said we don't need. And as they have learned, we need it a lot. And so I, I would say, whether you're the kind that says, oh, my gift isn't important, and maybe therefore you excuse, I don't need to serve the Lord. I don't need to be out there. When they're talking about making disciples, that must be somebody else. And I, and I think the picture of this says, every person has an incredibly important part, important part to play. And my question to you would be, are you playing the part that God's called you to? If you had a picture that, that the health of family church depended on how well you were, you were carrying your load, would that change the way you paid attention? Would that change the way you learned? Would that change the way you serve? And I, I like to ask this question because I think it really flips the, the script. What if everybody at our church were serving and were devoted and were following Christ like you are? What if you were the model for the whole church? How would we be as a church? And I think that that challenges us to think about, am I doing my part? So what is the church? Well, the body of Christ is a great picture. And I hope that as we've talked about this, you've come to see that that old picture that says we go to church, that it's a building, it's a program, it's, it's a place where we visit on Sunday, that I hope you get that out of your mind. And COVID is giving us an excellent opportunity to reset our thinking. There was a period of time for this last year when we couldn't even be in the building and then we were limited in what we could do in the building. So is this a vital part of church? Yeah, this is an important part in our culture of how we celebrate church. But what about groups that get together and just pray? Is that the church? Yeah, that's the church. What, what about people that we reach out to across the world? This is a group from Cambodia that we share a common Christ with. Is that the church? What about people that are serving and they're just working in their workaday world and they're checking groceries, but somehow the way they treat people and the way they interact and the light that of Christ in them is making an impact on the people there. Is that the church? You see, the church isn't a meeting once a week, that's just a charge up and deployment and training time. The church is actually deployed into the community 24 seven. Is this the church when brothers and sisters get together and read and pray and challenge and encourage each other? Is this the church when, when somebody says, you know, my kid's in little league and maybe I'll be a coach, not just to, to have a winning season. But what about if their heart is I want to get to know these kids and get to know these families. And, and I'm going to look for that opportunity to share Christ with them or to share what God's doing in me or, or to be a witness and example. What about the needy people that we see around us? Is, is a genuine follower of Jesus reaching out to somebody who's hungry, who's cold, who's sick? Is that the church? And I hope that you can look at that and go, yeah, not only is that the church, but that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And, and honestly, we hear stories every week of people from family church, and it's kind of cool. Things that are not organized in a program, nobody's telling them to do it. People are just 
loving people in the name of Jesus. And that's what makes a church unstoppable. The second picture that I want to switch to, which also brings kind of some different things to the, to the, to the focus point is that the church is also called the bride of Christ. And I remember when I got married and Jan was beautifully dressed in her white wedding dress. And, and I remember seeing her for the first time and we were taking pictures before the ceremony. And, and I thought, how incredibly blessed I am that God has gifted me with a wife like this. And you know, it's not just about being beautiful on the outside. It's about the fact that she shared a love for Christ and a love for ministry. And, and we had a common bond all the way through. And then when we said, I do, and I commit my life to you, what a, what an incredible privilege. And the body of Christ is something that all of us have. When we talk about the bride of Christ, I know that sometimes a few guys get a little uncomfortable. Like, <laughs> I'm not a bride. I don't look good in white. Uh, veil wouldn't cover up enough. I, I just am a little uncomfortable with that picture. And I think it's honestly a good thing to step into because it's one of those places where the, the Bible kind of elevates the role of women and what, what they are doing in demonstrating the, the church and what a, what a vital role and how the, the Bible speaks to that as a high and holy calling. And a, and a beautiful picture. And I, and I think it's also really empowering for the ladies as they look at that and say, yeah, that is a picture that I want to emulate. And in Ephesians, he talks, the scripture talks about the fact that, that this picture of marriage, of a bride and a bridegroom is to be a, a representative of how the church responds to Christ. And then also how a wife responds to her husband. So I was at a wedding just recently and it had kind of a funny seeing of the bride. So often in, in weddings that are done outdoors, instead of waiting to the, the time the bride walks down the aisle, there is a reveal ahead of time where the bride and the groom see each other in all of their finery for the wedding for the first time. And so in this case, they really elevated it. So the bride and all her friends went off to some place to get all beautified and get all dressed and be all ready. And then they drove back in and the groom was sequestered over here. And they were very intentional that they had them face away from each other and sort of slowly back in until the, the photograph moment where they were ready to turn and to see each other. And so then they turned and they saw each other. And what they saw is that the bride, in addition to her beautiful white wedding dress that she had also put on a Tyrannosaurus Rex inflatable costume. And the hilarious part for everybody watching is she thought she was going to shock her groom. She thought it was going to be this kind of moment where he was like, oh, I can't believe you did that. But when they turned around, they found out that he had dressed up in a costume also. He had this like big caterpillar that he was riding on with fake legs and he was wearing it around his neck. And they looked at each other and in that moment, they just broke out laughing and I thought to myself, I think these two deserve each other to have the same, same kind of concept, same idea. But that idea of how we do weddings is not how it was done in the first century. So if we're going to understand what it means to be the bride of Christ and how that picture is really so appropriate, you need to go back to a understanding. And it's on the other side of your page if you're taking notes on the paper notes. And that's the word betrothal. And it means a solemn pledge of marriage long before a wedding ceremony. Now, in our culture, it's often the opposite, that people fall in love or they get married or they live together. And then at some point down the road, they have a ceremony. This was like the opposite cultural way, which is that the parents arranged the marriage. And it was far more a financial and long range and what's going to be best for my kid and for our family kind of negotiation Romance was often had little or nothing to do with it, as frankly, as in many parts of the world today still. But that arrangement was made and they were pledged to be married. They were betrothed to each other. And of course, we have a picture with Joseph and Mary of this going on. And then, listen, this was a binding commitment. They were considered married at that point so that if they were to break this, this betrothal, they had to get a divorce. But what happened then is in a time period when most people couldn't afford to live away from their parents right away anyway, 
that the husband would go and he would prepare a place for her. He would go and add a room onto the house or add a, another house back in the back part of the property so that when he finished that at some undesignated time, he could then come and reclaim his bride and take her to live with him in their new place that he had, he had developed. And I'm sure if you've read any of the New Testament, you're hearing the, the pictures that this picture of marriage really speaks to how we are as a church and how we are to respond. So let me tell you the couple things I think we learned from the picture of the bride of Christ. So we're going to switch to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 11. And the apostle Paul is talking to a group of believers. He led them to the Lord. They were kind of a mess. And so he's trying to correct them and trying to keep them from going astray. And he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning. Let me, let me pause here just a minute. Paul's saying, I'm like this person who has arranged the betrothal. I am like the person who has helped you make this deal where you're promised to each other. And my set goal is to present you as a pure bride, a pure virgin, to Jesus, to the husband. He said, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. I hope you see that that's emphasized there. For if someone comes to you and preaches Jesus, other than the Jesus that we preached, or if you received a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. You see, Paul is being a little bit sarcastic and a little bit strong as he talks to them about the fact that there have been false teachers that have come to the church at Corinth and they begin talking about a different kind of Jesus. There are false teachers who have begun talking about a different spirit. There's false teachers who are talking about a different gospel, the good news of how we have eternal life through Christ. And he's agonizing. He says, I thought you were going to be true to your promise. And he actually uses that term. I want you to be sincere and to have a pure devotion. So if you understand the importance of that picture, you're saying, I will be faithful to Christ. I have made a pledge and a promise responding to his pledge and promise to me that everyone who believes in me, who trusts my sacrifice on the cross to provide eternal life, they will be saved. They are saved. But there's this picture of the fact that we have a promise that's secure, but we are in a waiting period until we actually are fully realizing that in heaven. And so we are in this committed relationship, but we haven't yet experienced all the wonderful benefits of the wedding and of the marriage. And in fact, one of the features in Revelation talks about the wedding feast of the lamb. And it talks about this joyful reunion of Jesus with his people. So the question is, am I faithful to Christ? And let me just talk a little bit about what I think that means. Obviously, if you're betrothed to your husband and you cheat on him with another man, that's not being faithful. We, we clearly know that in every culture. But as I think about the picture with my wife and myself, and I love Jan and I'm devoted to her, then I would never cheat on her. But boy, it's easy to get distracted to get focused on other things, to have other people flooding into my life and to just slowly edge her out to the edge. And I think exactly the same thing can happen with Christ, that we can, we can become distracted by other things. And it's easy for us also to become very critical of the church. I remember Pastor Will, he went away to a conference and he came back and he, he was sharing with me when he was a single guy thinking about, wouldn't it be wonderful to be married? And, and he was really wanting to pursue that. And he said he felt like the Lord really spoke to him at that, at that conference that Will needed to learn to treasure Jesus' bride, the church, before Jesus was going to give him his own bride at how can I entrust a bride to you if you haven't learned to love my bride? And as we talked about that, and as we reflected together, 
I thought, how many people beat up on the church? You know, it's, it's the topic of conversation. The church is like this, and the church is like that, and this is terrible, and that's terrible. And, and believe me, the church has lots of flaws. But as he was sharing that picture with me, I, I just promptly said, you know what? If you go up to a guy who's newly married and you start telling him that his wife has pimples and she's plain and you don't like the color of her hair and she's a little plump and man, what's your relationship with the groom going to be? And I thought, you know, it's easy for us to talk about the church in a way that's not encouraging, not strengthening, not, not bringing us together. It's just, just picking at it. And the other way I think that we can be unfaithful is that we become extremely selfish. It's so easy for us to make the experience of being in a church all about me. I want it to meet my needs and I want it to, to sing the songs I want. And I want it to be having the programs that I want. And, and, and there's a word for that. Uh, when a bride becomes cranky and irritable and selfish and focused on what I want and how this wedding is about me, we have a term for that. We call her bridezilla. And, you know, we want to be the bride of Christ. We don't want to be the bridezilla of Christ. And I, and I think there's a powerful lesson there. And then there's a second piece to this whole betrothal picture. Is that he's coming back. Jesus said to the disciples, I'm going to go away and I'm going to prepare a place. And when I've prepared a place, I will come back to get you so that you can be with me. You can be where I am. And you know, it's sad to me how many people start talking about what's going to happen in the future. And people wish we talked about Jesus coming back all the time. And other people have all these specific dates and these things have to happen and those things have to happen. And the sad thing is, is that the promise that Jesus was coming back was supposed to unite us in an anticipation of soon he's going to be here. And instead, we often divide up over exactly when he's going to be here or how we know that. And there's a verse that as I was thinking about this very truth, that the groom has gone away and he's preparing a place and he's going to come back at some point. Why, why wasn't Jesus more specific? I mean, you read the verses in the New Testament. And in the first chapter of Acts, it says that Jesus was ascending into heaven. It's like he slowly rose up and went into heaven. And the disciples are sitting there looking back, trying to see where he went. And then all of a sudden it says two men in white. You know who those are? The angels showed up and they said, why are you still looking up? This same Jesus that you saw depart is going to come back in the same way. And you think, so they thought he was coming in their lifetime. And clearly in the New Testament, there are several references. Yeah, they, they thought he could be back at any moment. So why has Jesus been so vague about exactly when it's going to happen? And I think there's a reason for that that people miss. The reason is that he's vague enough so that every generation of believers from that moment till now can think, it might be today. I, I need to live my life in readiness. It's a reminder that this world, this material world is going to disappear. And that the only thing that matters is when I stand before my king and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And that reminder, and especially you just see world events and you think, whoa, that kind of looks like revelation. That should just be a trigger, not to fight with somebody else, but a trigger to think, am I living? So that if today were the day Jesus were coming back, I would be ready. I would be anticipating. And I love it the way that, that Paul says it in 2 Timothy. He says, now there is in store for me, he's talking personally, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul talked about many places, the hardships that he went through in his life and how many times he was beaten and how many times he was shipwrecked. And there was just a lot of stuff that went on in his life. And, and he keeps trying to remind us and help us by sharing. When he got to those places, what did he go back to? He went back to, there's a store for me. The things that I'm doing for Jesus, they count forever. There's going to be a crown of righteousness, not only because of the righteousness of Jesus that I've been granted, but because the rewards that come from serving and living my life in connection with him. And then he says, it'll be not only to me, but also to everybody else who lives 
in anticipation, who lives with a longing. And I don't know what you specifically believe about how soon Jesus could come or when he will come. I just tell you, it's closer today than it was yesterday. And it could be any time. And that is a, supposed to be a momentum builder for you and me. So, so what, are the, what are the takeaways from all of this? It, it's easy for our lives to be shaped by what we look forward to. We can anticipate our next vacation or the next weekend or, or the next time we get to take a trip or our next birthday or, or maybe retirement or some, something you're looking forward to. And our life course is changed by what we are keenly anticipating. What, what the reward we are looking forward to. And the Bible uses that and says, I want you to get that focused on Jesus. So how does that teach us about why the church is unstoppable? Well, I'll go back and tell you again, every single local church is very stoppable. But that the people of God who are filled with the spirit of God, who are fueled by the power of God, who are committed to the kingdom, to the mission of God, that group will always be unstoppable. There is an unbroken chain from the time of Jesus down to us that spread all over the world. And I guess the key thing I want to ask you is, does your heart yearn to be involved with that? Do you want to look inside and say, have I been pure and faithfully devoted to Christ? Am, am I doing my part in the body? Am I, am I playing my part to bring health and strength to the body? Am I, am I living as though Jesus is the focus of my affection? Is, am I living that he's coming back soon? And I hope that your heart says, that's who I want to be. That's the church I want to be part of. I'm going to hand off to the campuses, to the online, as well as the physical campuses. And I want them, the leaders there, to help just encourage you to take this personally and ask yourself, what am I going to do with this? Thanks for joining us.